you. I think you'll all agree that that was uh, fascinating. You covered so much ground uh, in such a short space of time. I'm going to ask the first question and then I'll throw the floor open to all of you. You know, you touch in passing, of course, about a subject but that both you and I are uh, equally interested in, which is the P5. I mean, there is, I think, one country that is the most obvious next candidate is India. I mean, just, just because, you know, in, in, in India's standing in the world, in purchasing power parity terms now, the number one economy in the world is China, number two, United States, number three is India. So it, clearly you made it, in a sense, into that league. But if you had, you know, since you know the UN well, and you know India well, is there a secret passage you can think of no. that can get India into the UN Security Council? <laughs> no, and I think that if there were a secret passage, the compatriots of my friend, the Pakistani High Commissioner, would ensure that, that it, was, it was blocked. <laughs> so we live, in, uh, inter no, we live in an interdependent world. So the first right. country you have to convince is Pakistan, obviously. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, you know, part of the challenge is that uh, really the bar to amend the charter, the UN charter, has been mm. set very high. Yeah. You need two-thirds of the General Assembly, which is now 128 countries, to mm. vote in favor of whatever formula yeah. is, is agreed. Uh, and it'll have to be a formula because India will not benefit alone. If there is going to be reform of the Security Council, it'll have to take into account the legitimate claims of a whole number of other actors. Mm. And, of course, the diagnosis that the Council is deeply lopsided because it really does reflect the geopolitical realities of 1945, not just the P5, the permanent five members, but even the fact that Europe, with 5% of the world's population, has 33% of the Security Council seats. Why should it? I mean, 40%. There, there's some, well, 40 if you count Russia as a European. Yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, the fact is that, yeah, I mean, it is, of course, both a European and a Eurasian now. Yeah. So the fact is that you're looking at, uh, at a totally anomalous situation, and, and therefore the formula will have to satisfy all these contenders. But at the same time, this formula, after being passed by two-thirds of the members of the General Assembly, then has to be ratified by two-thirds of the member states, including all five permanent members the very countries whose powers you're trying to dilute. Now, that's what the Charter requires. So, it has to be a formula that's simultaneously acceptable to two-thirds of the countries and not unacceptable to these five, and they don't even need to oppose it officially because ratification in most countries is a parliamentary procedure. So, you suddenly find a U.S. senator just pockets the bill to ratify it and it never comes to a vote. Or uh, the Chinese say, you know, we have this very important parliament, the Chinese People's Consultative Committee, mm. and there are important interests there that won't allow this to be voted yet. And then ratification never happens, even if you get it through the General Assembly. Mm. So the great challenge with um, amending the Charter is what lies behind uh, the, the difficulty in, re in reforming the UN Security Council. Way back in 1992, the then mm. newly elected Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali said UN Security Council must be accomplished in time, uh, reform must be accomplished in time for the 50th anniversary of the organization in 1995. <laughs> well, the 50th has gone by, the 60th has gone by, the 70th went by last year. And I really wonder how long uh, this, this will take. And what worries me, Kishore, just to finish the thought, yeah. is that if it doesn't go on, yeah. whether the relevance of the United Nations yeah. is going to look in increasingly sort of threadbare uh, in a world in which other powers have acquired a status and an influence yeah. that is no longer... A Imagine if sanctions were declared on some South Asian yeah. country, a neighbor of ours without India being consulted, yeah. or in Southern Africa without South Africa being consulted, or sanctions were declared... Um, uh, that's just really one kind of example. Many other actions a council can take. Ultimately, a point will come when a powerful enough country will say, sorry, Council, mm. we're not going to listen to you. We will not honor these sanctions. Mm. And then what happens if the legitimacy of, of mm. the Council is undermined, international law and the entire yeah. underpinnings of the international structure get compromised. So I think it's yeah. very important for those of us who are multilateralists like Ishore and me to, to plead for reform in the interests of the organization itself mm. and not just those of any countries that may benefit. Okay. Okay. Questions? I see you, some gentlemen. Please, go ahead. Please come to the microphone, if you don't mind. Just come up to the microphone, those who want to ask And do ask tell, me, tell me sort of who you are. You're a student, are you a teacher, are you somebody else? Yeah, Where hi, Dr. Thera. I'm Sumant, and I'm a business management student at a private university here in Singapore. Right. 
Uh, I've followed a few of your speeches and um, uh, since you're a seasoned diplomat, India's, India has around 160, 165 missions around the world. But the number of diplomats is somewhere less than 900. And Brazil has over 4,000. UK has over 6,000. Brazil China, has 1,200. Uh, China yes. has And the US has yeah. 20,000. In fact, Correct. as you mentioned in one of your speeches, US has more talented diplomats in its embassy in New Delhi than India has all over the world. Correct. So when you believe that India is uh, understaffed in its foreign, uh, foreign uh, civil servants, uh, you believe that should only people who clear Indian Foreign Services exam should be posted there because most of the businesses, uh, most of the uh, relations between two countries are based on business and trade. So how about uh, posting some business management professionals <laughs> for doing <laughs> I agree, that? Yeah. I agree. Well, look, uh, this is you a know, cause Shashi, I have. Let me, shall we take two, three questions since there's sure. a lot of them. Okay. Yeah, you we just you can take a note. Yeah. So the first question on the size of the Indian Foreign Service, please. Question here. Hi, I'm Prem, MPP student at the school and I'm from Nepal. In relation uh, to such a big topic, and what role do you think should India play to maintain peace and tranquility in Sark region, uh, particularly taking in consideration to its uh, worsening relationship with small neighbors? My second question is, what fears India to bring China into Sark as active member? Thank you. Okay, can we look at the question of the third mic there? Yes. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hello, yes, my name is uh, Anish Mishra. I'm, uh, I'm doing a degree here in Singapore. My question is, um, I would like to get comments from you on the wisdom of, um, of, of um, Modi's utterance of Balochistan from the, from the Red Fraud. I, I believe um, Congress party has said that they, they actually stand with the government of this um, so, I mean, I'll get your, your views on this and how do you think this is actually a game changer for India on the, on the larger Kashmir issue? Thanks. Okay, three questions. Go ahead. Okay, I'll take them in the order in which they were asked. So first on the Foreign Service, let me stress that uh, this is certainly my view. And I have actually um, written this in the book, uh, Pax Indicap, developed on the theme uh, subsequently as chairman of the Standing Committee of Parliament on Foreign Affairs. And very recently, we have issued a very strong report, of which I am, of course, the author, so by all means, go into it. Uh, it, it, it made some, some, some waves in the Indian media when it came out, um, making a number of recommendations that the ministry is obliged to respond to. It's not necessarily obliged to adopt. But um, uh, the following, uh, this is after extensive hearings with the foreign ministry personnel and with other ministries. Uh, the first is, indeed, we need to increase the size significantly. The authorized number of diplomatic positions in India is 922, but they only have 740 people on board. Uh, secondly, they, their chosen method of expansion, which is by hiring more youngsters every year, doesn't solve the problem because um, uh, they need certain gaps to be filled right now, and the people whom they're hiring now will only be trained and effective 10 years from now, so they're not doing anything about today's needs. Third, there's a serious issue of quality. We are no longer getting the best and the brightest um, of the uh, central UPSC examinations opting for the Foreign Service. In fact, it's now no longer a favored choice, a dramatic transformation from the days in which you really had to be in the top 10 to actually get into the Foreign Service. Today, uh, they're really quite dredging the bottom, I shouldn't say bottom of the barrel, because tens of thousands of people take the exam and only a few hundred pass. But from those who pass, um, uh, they're, they're going fairly low, low down the pile to get their officers. And I don't think the best diplomats are people who really wanted to be cops or customs officers or whatever. Um, then there's a question of uh, the one-size-fits-all examination. Doesn't really look for the kinds of qualities that you need in a diplomat. And so we have urged that uh, there should be either an additional paper for those who opt for the Foreign Service, or there should be extra weightage given in the interview to such qualities as curiosity about the world, uh, a talent or aptitude for uh, languages, uh, a capacity to explain things to foreigners, uh, the ability to articulate ideas effectively. These are extremely important skills in diplomacy that you cannot assess by a written paper. Uh, and, and which very often, in fact, are lacking in some of the people now being recruited. And then we, we also go into the question of training subsequent upon recruitment. Uh, I have gone so far as to suggest that we open the examinations to NRIs, non-resident Indian students, um, who are Indian citizens, of course, 
but who have not studied in the Indian system, have studied in places like Singapore or Kuwait or Dubai or Paris or London, uh, and who have all these qualities, often have grown up learning foreign languages in the countries where they are, but who say Hindi isn't good enough to take the foreign service exam, that to let them do it, and the ministry has accepted the suggestion that maybe those who have studied at least 50% of their schooling abroad should be allowed to waive the Indian language requirement and still join the service. So these are all ideas. And then, of course, we have gone in for, uh, for, for the notion of lateral entry, which you mentioned, that we should get in people from other professions, academia, uh, the private sector, including management types, uh, uh, but also you know, journalists for our public diplomacy work or uh, uh, people who are not career civil servants, bring them in on a contract basis, even in mid to senior positions, so that we actually gain from the experience they've acquired in the real world. Now, all these suggestions out there, they're on the table. Uh, I've advocated them passionately in the media as well as in the uh, parliament. If we have an opportunity to debate this in parliament, you can be sure that I'll make a very strong pitch for this. Shashi, Whether it'll get you, may have, you may have to make your answer shorter because there are lots of questions. A <laughs> lot of questions, all right. But you get By the way, you can read his report. <laughs> read my report. It's actually on the web. It's on the web. Go to the Lok Sabha and look for the report of the Standing Committee. <laughs> yeah, we have these sittings of the Standing Committee, which I always find quite <laughs> peculiar, but we do it. Um, on the question of neighbors, obviously extremely important. I've been one of those who's advocated for some time that India can afford to have the attitude that we should have asymmetrical relations with our neighbors, that is, we should give more than we expect to get. You sit around a table in the SARC, and India accounts for 70% of the total population of South Asia and 80% of the total GDP. So inevitably, whether we like it or not, we displace more weight, we get in people's faces, we, our elbows uh, poke into their midriffs. We really need to worry about this. I mean, it's a problem common to every big country in its neighborhood. I've forgotten which country it was that had the famous line, uh, you know, cursing God for being so far from God and so close to the United States. Mexico. Uh, Mexico. <laughs> the same sort of notion. You know, we are, we are, uh, we are perhaps uh, evoking similar feelings on the part of many of our neighbors. So we do need to give, give great importance. Certainly, during my brief stint in the foreign ministry, that was one of my recurrent themes. I know that the government of India... Uh, is in principle committed to this. I also know that in practice, things always don't, don't always work out the way we'd like them to, and that some of the relationships are, are, are not terribly good at the moment. Mind you, not, in not every bad relationship is India the only one to blame. I'll I, I leave it there. I think there are sometimes uh, responsibilities on both sides, but I certainly agree that India should do more and should give more. Finally, on the question of, of the no, Baluchistan no. reference. No, no, before that, he was suggesting one way to make sure to solve the problem of the elephant in the room is to bring in the other elephant, China, into Sark. <laughs> oh, he did suggest that. He did suggest that. You're quite right. Um, you know, at the moment, I, I'm a bit agnostic on this question. I think the South Asian Association, by definition, is for South Asian countries. Uh, and unless Tibet becomes independent, I don't see a, a South Asian possibility emerging out of a place like Beijing. So I think we have to accept that China is not a South Asian power. Uh, it, it, it can certainly be an East Asian power. It is a Central Asian power to some degree, but a South Asian power I think is debatable. But an observer status I'm 100% in favor of, uh, uh, just as I think um, uh, India uh, will have observer status now, it does have it now in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. I think the same logic should be applied to SARC and they should be invited to be observers. Uh, uh, hmm? Baluchistan. Now, on that one, the, the position taken by my party was that it is not customary for us to refer to the internal disputes of other states simply because we have always taken the position that we don't interfere in other countries' internal affairs and that uh, for um, the fact that Pakistan refers to our internal affairs in its speeches uh, is something that is condemnable, not worth imitating. That's broadly speaking why some Congress party spokesmen have criticized this. I would go a little beyond that. I think that point is fair. I think it's one of these issues where there are good arguments on both sides. I think that point is a very fair one. Uh, uh, another point that's worth making is that there have been for some years now unsubstantiated, and many of us believe unfounded, allegations from the Pakistani side that India has been meddling in Baluchistan through its intelligence agencies and so on. Uh, to my knowledge, that is simply not true. It's also not very feasible given that India doesn't share a border with Baluchistan. So uh, by 
seeming to elevate the issue to a prime ministerial speech, it may unnecessarily give fodder to the conspiracy theorists who've already been attacking India for something that it believes it hasn't done. So why are we weakening our own defense in this area? That's the second objection. But on the flip side of it is the feeling that uh, India has taken so much of needling from Pakistan on every issue from Kashmir to the uh, situation of Indian minorities and in, in, uh, Muslims in particular in India and so on, that it's time to push some needles in the opposite direction also. And uh, now you may say that this, what we in India call tutu meh meh, should not be <laughs> worthy of a prime ministerial discourse. That's another debate. But you can understand the reason why perhaps as many Indians applauded this reference as objected to it on the grounds I've described. Anyway, we have, uh, like the Egyptian mummy, we are strapped for time. <laughs> so we have Let's five minutes. Let's run slightly over. We started five minutes over. late. Yeah. So, I tell you what, why don't we just take, if you don't mind, there's, I see, I count, there's seven of you, seven of you remains there. Just pose very short, sharp questions, and then... Uh, I'll give you long-winded answers. And, 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 and he will give a very, uh, uh, the, 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 the fastest long-winded answer in history. <laughs> in three minutes. So can you start with you, and then we quickly go around. Yeah, uh, we'll take notes. Yeah, um, Abhishek Vaidyanathan, I'm an exchange student from Canada uh, at the law school here. Um, my question is with regards to um, the effect on, on labor that automation might have and how that might affect the 21st century and India's um, global relations within that. Um, you know, one prediction with the significant loss of labor would be that uh, you know, potential solutions that have been posed include um, minimum wage standards, um, also a potential rise in protectionism as well. So how might India cope with that and what is your um, view on that potential uh, effect of automation on India's economy as well. Okay, good. Could the gentleman behind you, please. Question two. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you very much for this uh, really amazing talk, uh, Dr. Uh, Tharoor. My name is uh, Paricha Chatterjee, and my question is that a lot of people seem to, it's a bit more generic, a lot of people seem to um, uh, talk about India in the context of uh, a superpower or at least one of many in future. But do you really think that that might be good for India, given the fact that at least in recent history, most of the, the big powers, the superpowers, have been uh, countries which are relatively more centralized, uh, like maybe Russia or, um, or the US, or maybe China, uh, an emerging China. But a country like India, which is so diverse, uh, might spend a lot of time bickering amongst ourselves uh, to kind of say that, okay, this is what we need to do in order to rise up uh, and, and play a dominant role or one of many uh, in, in the world. So, so that's my question, whether we should, uh, we, we should aspire towards that. And a, a very quick follow-up question is that maybe, we also... <laughs> maybe not a follow-up question. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll try my best with respect to uh, the problems that we have with our neighbors, um, the disputes that we have. Do you think that it is more of a nuisance for India or do you think it is something that we will need to confront in order to realize the potential over time. Thank you. Okay, the lady please, yes. Uh, my name is Neha Simlai, I'm from India and I'm uh, an MPA student this year at the LKY school. Um, I wanted to check with you, uh, what do you think the future of the party you represent is in Pax Indica and also who amongst the current leadership in your party is going to steer India into Pax Indica? Uh, the name is Shashi Taru. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Good evening, Dr. Tharoor. Thanks for the speech. That was fantastic. My name is Sagar Desai, and I work in asset management here. A uh, quick question around your first, the, f the very first point that you make. Um, it's around how India was a victim to bureaucracy, which was at the which was at the top of the commanding chain in India for the first 40, 50 years. However, when I look when I look at the Singapore model, actually I find that the bureaucracy was right at the top, and still it succeeded way beyond uh, way beyond its uh, uh, its expected potential. So I feel it was the failure of the bureaucracy in those 40 years that led to India's demise in those 40 years than it being the reason why it, it couldn't succeed. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, okay, please, up there, yes. A very good evening, uh, Dr. Tharoor. I am Ketan and I'm doing my Master's in International Relations from uh, RSIS NTU. And I have uh, two small questions related to the quick Islamic ones. world. Quick, quick ones. ones, yeah, really quick, I'll be quick. First is, uh, 
on the question of uh, India's role in the new Middle East, especially on the question related to the recognition of the Syrian opposition. And the second one is related to Kashmir. Why is our Kashmir policy failing despite engaging with the non-state actors? So these are two. Okay. Thank you. The gentleman behind you, then we'll come to the... Um, okay, I'll just stick to the question. The question is um, whether you would agree with the 7-7 seven, seven, uh, reform policy that Professor Kishor has, uh, has proposed for the United Nations Security Council with seven, 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 permanent. seven permanent, permanent members, seven semi-permanent members and seven elected members. Thank you. Yes, please. Good evening, Dr. Tharoor. Thank you for your enthralling le lecture, first of all. I have a very short question. We have talked a lot about the co social cohesion, political cohesion, and interdependence between Asian economies, especially in the prevailing anti-globalization sentiment that is there. How far do you think India's foreign relations with Pakistan, especially the belligerent a stance adopted by Pakistan towards India and its foreign relations would define India's role in the world of 21st century as a champion of globalization. Thank you. Well, you covered all. So now you're going to give us the fastest, long-winded answer. <laughs> we, we began five minutes late. <laughs> five so minutes. You give me five minutes. We'll finish five minutes sure. late. Okay. Um, Abhishek on um, automation. Labor. Automation's effect on on labor and the risk of. Um, protectionism and wage stand. Very, very important question, it seems to me. And, and the truth is that at one point, the developments in modern technology were actually benefiting India. For example, the fact that um, American hospitals that couldn't afford to pay the technicians who were reading their MRIs could zing these MRIs across to India, have them read by equally qualified technicians in India, and get the diagnosis and the readings back overnight. That was extraordinary. I mean, pretty much every MRI from every major hospital in America is actually being read in India. So that was actually technology working to benefit Indians, uh, just as, for example, um, a lot of um, jobs that used to be done by paralegals in the US in preparing briefs and legal documentation are now being written by fully qualified lawyers in India for less money than you'd have to pay a paralegal in America. And again, it's done using modern technology. But what happens when these paralegals are replaced by, by robots uh, that can process the text and do the work? What happens when the MRIs can be read by newly sophisticated computer software? These are questions that we don't yet have answers to, but all sorts of professions are said to be under threat. Um, one of the interesting things is, for example, the invention of the driverless car. Uh, in Singapore, a friend of mine proudly showed me his new car and said, this is the last car I'm ever going to buy because I replace my cars every seven years, and within seven years, nobody in Singapore will need a car like this. We'll all be driving driverless cars. And I said, wow, and he probably is right in Singapore. I think it may take longer in India, but you know, we have at least 25 million people whose full-time job is being a driver. Uh, that is, unlike in the Western world, many of us are driven from place to place by full-time drivers. And what happens to them? We suddenly have a whole bunch of people who are not qualified to do anything else. But, but drive a vehicle. So there, there are enormous risks. Um, I think there will be some resistance to the encroachments of some of this technology, for one thing. Um, I, 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 for example, I would not invest in a driverless car company uh, in, in India uh, because I'm not sure it's going to make much headway. Uh, because of other things apart, there will be a lot of resistance for, for this reason. Um, but uh, the question of uh, protectionism, which he mentions, the question of, uh, of threats to wage standards, cutting people's wages so they can compete against the robots, that may begin to happen. India has an enormous demographic advantage over countries like China. China is now investing heavily in robots because their population is aging. India has people, a young, dynamic workforce available for the next 50 years. So what are we going to do? Are we going to allow autom automation to destroy the prospects of these young people? I, I, I don't think so. So the answers are not fully known, but the, the trends and the concerns are very clear. Pariche on, on can we aspire to be a superpower? In all fairness, that was what my entire speech was about. It was about, I started off by saying we can't be a superpower when we're still super poor. And I tried in the course of my talk to explain that rather than a world of superpowers, I think we should move beyond the notion of superpowers to one of networked cooperation. And that was the kind of world of which India is capable of playing a central role. That was the entire speech of Pax Indica. 
Uh, Neha asked about the future of the Congress Party. I think it's very bright. Uh, we have a. We, I would say that. You can't I, say anything else, right? Uh, I was afraid you'd say that. But the truth is that. The truth is that you know all dem democracies are cyclical. Uh, People go up and down. At the moment, Mr. Modi is personally riding high in the polls. His party is actually plunging in the polls at the same time. And we are a parliamentary system. I think people are looking for alternatives to those who would flog Dalits for skinning a cow, for example. And there's not much sympathy for that kind of behavior, which is associated with the ruling party. So I have, uh, I have a reasonable amount of hope uh, that um, in the longer term, certainly, you will see a major revival of the Congress party. As to who will lead it, it's very clear that the inevitable transition will be uh, to Rahul Gandhi, the current vice president of the party. Uh, thereafter, as happens in all politics, uh, every leadership is tested by the electorate and before the electorate. And we will have to demonstrate our capacity to go out and get the votes and to convince people that we represent the best possible vehicle for their hopes and aspirations. I believe we do. Uh, on um, bureaucracy. Failure of bureaucracy in the first 40 years. I think that's only partly true because, in fact, in that very, very protectionist world, uh, we really did get the best of the bond, the best and the brightest into the bureaucracy. Uh, the cream of the crop didn't have that many other options. I mean, you know, we had an increasingly closed and closing economy. Uh, if you went into uh, the private sector, basically were selling soap and detergents. There wasn't a whole lot of exciting stuff happening in the private sector in India. The private sector wasn't where the action was. The public sector was making even economic policies, so you could actually manage gigantic steel companies and gigantic public sector corporations by being a bureaucrat rather than being a businessman. Why would you want to be a businessman? So the best and the brightest of our universities took the examinations, went into the bureaucracy in those first 40 years. I agree that the system and the experiment failed, but I'm not sure you can build, blame the quality of the people who went into it as much as in the original conception. And even there, you can't blame them because they were actually learning from the lessons of their own history. Their, India was not the only country that made the mistake. In fact, Singapore should be complimented for being one of the very few countries that chose an alternative path. Most countries did not choose Singapore's path. And some even said grudgingly that Singapore had no choice because they were cut off from a hinterland and therefore they had to be global. Whereas a country like India with potentially a vast domestic market could have afforded to have import substitution, protectionism and so on as its mantra. But of course the inefficiencies of the public sector that India presided over sadly became more and more apparent and we were slow to learn the lessons that China for example embarked upon 13 years before we did their liberalization of the economy we just were, were too slow to learn. And there you can blame the politicians and the bureaucrats in equal measure. Uh, Chetan on uh, the, the new Middle East, India's role, Syrian opposition. India, I'm sorry to say, and I really am sorry to say this, does not have a role of any significance in the Middle East. And it's ironic because way back in the 50s, we were the preferred interlocutor for pretty much uh, any major crisis, whether it was the Laos crisis, the Vietnam, the incipient Vietnam crisis, the Suez crisis, uh, India was a leading voice, a quick voice. We intervened, we came in, we were the first country to send troops uh, uh, when the UN peacekeeping force was set up after Suez, etc., etc., etc. But suddenly, not suddenly, over a, gradually over a period of time, India has become largely irrelevant to Middle East peacemaking, war fighting, uh, conciliation, the works. I, I, I can't usefully point to any major role we're playing. We even used to have a special envoy for the Middle East. The post has not been filled for many years, and it doesn't surprise me because he really didn't have very much useful to do. On Syria, India has publicly expressed some sympathy uh, for the existing government. It has not supported it directly the way in which, say, Russia is doing. It has actually spoken up in favor of a managed democratic transition via a sort of broad-based uh, accommodative government to a different system. So it's not said that it wants this regime to continue indefinitely. But there is a great deal of sympathy for India in Syria and, uh, and, and uh, India's loath to jettison uh, its old friendships. I mean, Syria, uh, Iraq have been amongst the countries that were sympathetic to India even when, for example, uh, there was a certain amount of organized uh, hostility within the organization of the Islamic countries, for example, 
towards India on the Kashmir issue, those countries did not join the anti-Indian bandwagon and, and there has to be some reciprocity in turn uh, from the beneficiary of their sympathies. So I would say that India um, has been therefore perhaps uh, not generally a major player in the Middle East and on Syria in particular, it has sort of said there should be a negotiated solution. No one is trying a negotiated solution, so the suggestion is, is not terribly relevant in the present situation. There was a question about Kashmir policy. It would really take too long. I would encroach horribly on Kishore's time, so I'm going to pass on that, especially since it was the second question from the same questioner. Uh, <laughs> just to say that uh, uh, I would agree in one sentence that we can do a better job uh, both in dealing with Kashmir domestically and in projecting our point of view internationally. A much better job. Uh, on the 777 formula, I need to discuss it further with Kishore, which is not a cop-out. Uh, I, I clearly understand that formula will have to be found beyond the existing attempt of merely expanding the permanent membership and the non-permanent membership. Uh, but the problem is if, if the original attempt is so difficult, wouldn't a complete reinvention be even more difficult? That is the, the question. Not to mention, of course, the dangers of creating a new caste system at the international level with these sort of three castes that you can aspire to of permanent, semi-permanent, and non-permanent. But um, I'll tell you what, I'll have a conversation with Kishore about this. And one point I might come back to the Lee Kuan Yew School and we can talk about UN reform. And I've now forgotten the last question because I... A social wasn't... cohesion. Social cohesion in the context, I think the word belligerence was used. Oh, it, it doesn't really. I think everyone sees... Pakistan's problem as a, as a purely bilateral problem, which has in many ways more to do with the challenges Pakistan's um, system poses. I mean, it's not an open secret. I've said it before publicly, and if the High Commissioner wishes to object, I'll take the objection in advance. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I've often pointed out the difference is that in India, the state has an army. In Pakistan, the army has a state. And in no country in the world does the army command a larger proportion of that country's GDP and that country's government budget than the army of Pakistan does. And as a result, many of its policies to its neighbors on either side, to India and to Afghanistan, are shaped by the interests of the military rather than by the interests of the Pakistani people. That's my view and that's the view of many in India. Uh, and I think many observers abroad, judging by the books that have been written by Americans and British journalists and so on in recent years, I would suggest that no one sees that as in any way um, undermining India's ability to advocate the policies of diversity, uh, of, of uh, increasing global democracy, of increasing global networks that I summarized and described in my, in my remarks, uh, which I hope transcend the purely bilateral problems we unfortunately have with our dear and valued neighbor. I think you've all heard me say before that we are entering a new era of world history. We are seeing the return of Asia and clearly there's absolutely no doubt, as I said at the beginning of my remarks, that India's role is going to grow by leaps and bounds in the coming decades. But the changes that India's re-emergence will bring will be incredibly complex and will be multifaceted. So we are very fortunate that today, in the space of one hour, 15 minutes, Shashi has given us a glimpse of this very complex new world that is going to come our way. And we should all come together now and thank him for his wonderful address. In the thank you very much. We're a great audience. <laughs>